Hi all. I just wanted to give you a quick um, introduction to some of the methods in the Varicella Zuster paper for this coming week. Um, I'm hoping that a little lecture video might help more than just writing it out on a front page. So we'll see. Remember that VZV is in the herpes virus family. So everything that Charlotte had taught us about um, herpes virus applies, such as this is an enveloped linear double-stranded DNA virus. This is the virus that causes chicken pox and shingles. Um, it's about 124 KB genome, about 74 open reading frames. Um, they don't define these as 74 proteins because they don't know the functions of all of them. Um, so we keep it at called open reading frames, but that's really what it's implying, that there are protein coding um, regions, so probably about 74 proteins. And VZV has the ability to go latent. So what Dr. Kaur's lab is studying is latency and regulation of gene expression for varicella zoster. So this paper is looking at a technique used to help understand um, gene regulation. And my take home, and I'll show you this on the last slide, is that this is really a um, paper trying to um, show the validity of the technique they've developed and then to add a little bit of data though I will say that I have found that some of their conclusions um, have already been published in like 2012. So I think the main take home from this paper was that it is a way to study gene regulation using the chip assay and their sonication methods. So we'll talk about that in just a sec. Um, <clears throat> they're also looking at three different VZV genes. Um, I don't know exactly why they picked these three, although I think there are three that have been well studied. Um, open reading frame nine is abundantly expressed during virus infection, so that should be one that they can look at um, RNA polymerase initiating and going through transcription. Open reading frame five is an early protein, so again, one that they would predict um, would be actively expressed. And open reading frame 66 is um, a protein detected during latency. Okay, so later on in the virus infection. And I'll be honest, I've only read this paper one time through, taken some notes. Um, I will work more on it this weekend before we chat on Monday. So just to remind you a little bit, there's a lot of... Um, what I would think of as molecular biology kind of information in this paper. So I wanted to give you some background in case you're not familiar or you've forgotten some of this. So remember that, and we usually draw it with an arrow, there's a promoter for every gene. And the promoter is where RNA polymerase binds. Right, so we're looking at, in blue here is DNA. And for eukaryotic genes, there are lots of upstream elements or DNA sequences where other proteins bind and that helps um, bring on the RNA polymerase to the promoter and is important for regulating gene expression. Now they mentioned in the paper that in varicella zoster, the space between genes, hold on, I wrote it down, I think it's only like 272 base pairs. That's really small. So virus genomes are a lot more compact in general than eukaryotic genes. So um, between genes in a, a eukaryotic chromosome, right, you could have easily 10,000 base pairs or more. Remember, in our 3 billion 
base pairs, we only have about 5% of that as protein coding. So there are huge regions of our chromosome that are not gene coding, not open reading frames, not regulatory sequences. Um, and so the regulation of eukaryotic genes is going to be much different than the regulation of a viral genome. So that's one of the reasons um, they're working on this paper is to look at that. Um, remember transcription is making oops, RNA from DNA and that that RNA will eventually get translated to protein. RNA Paul 2 is the eukaryotic protein that transcribes messenger RNA. We also have RNA Paul 1 and RNA Paul 3. Those help transcribe ribosomal RNAs and um, tRNAs and some other RNAs. Okay, so RNA polymerase, hopefully you remember, binds DNA. It unwinds, so it opens up the double strand and through base pairing, it makes an RNA transcript. Okay. What you may or may not have learned, oh, let me, let me stop, let me get ahead of myself. Um, also, there are many different factors, oh, this should say plus, I hate it when it does that, plus factors, and whenever you hear the word factors, that means proteins. So there are lots of other proteins that interact with RNA polymerase to initiate transcription. Okay. And they kind of allude to some of these, um, but they're not actually looking at these right now in this paper. So what you may or may not know is that RNA polymerase has this C-terminal domain, or we call it a tail. Okay. And that's this little blue part right here. And so RNA polymerase not only is important for making the RNA molecule, but it has to help regulate capping, splicing, which is, means exons out, introns spliced together, and the three prime poly A tail. So what's really cool is this kind of trailing C-terminal domain on RNA polymerase will interact with these different proteins allowing a eukaryotic messenger RNA to be um, processed, cap, tail, splicing. And what regulates the interaction of the C-terminal domain plus um, processing proteins, we'll just call them, is the level of phosphorylation. So we draw it as a P with a circle. Oops, I can't spell. Phosphorylation. Okay, so um, I'll show you another slide about this, but this phosphorylation changes as the C-terminal domain interacts with other proteins. So the two uh, main states of phosphorylation they are looking at is called S, I didn't make sure I read this, S5, oh, I lost my pen, hold on. Yeah, S5P and S2P. Sorry. S5P, S2P. So the S stands for the amino acid serine. And um, there's this, if you look down here, there's, there's this heptad repeat on the C-terminal domain. So there's this repeat of tyrosine, serine, proline, threonine, serine, proline, serine. Tyrosine, serine, proline, threonine. Okay, so this heptad repeat repeats over and over and over and over again. They're only showing a few on this C-terminal tail. Um, but you can see the second amino acid and the fifth amino acid in this heptad repeat is the serine amino acid. OK, 
Okay, so this talks about the fifth um, amino acid, serine, getting phosphorylated, and this is the second serine getting phosphorylated. And so this diagram is trying to show you that as you start transcription, okay, you get the fifth serine, S5, phosphorylated. Okay. And through elongation, so now you are making the mRNA, the phosphorylations change and at the end of the transcript or the end of transcription, it's primarily serine 2 that's phosphorylated. Okay. So they are going to look at this change or lack of change in phosphorylation for viral transcripts or as the um, um, uh, excuse me, as the RNA polymerase is transcribing the viral genes. So the method they're using to detect, um, yeah, that's right, sorry. Um, the method they're using to detect protein DNA interaction is called CHIP. So CHIP stands for chromatin immuno precipitation. And I want to go through with you a little bit about this technique. It is always spelled capital C, lowercase h, capital I, capital P. So please, 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 when you type it, type it correctly. The basic steps for a chip assay is that you take your DNA and you cross-link it. So you add formaldehyde and you may remember that we talked about adding formaldehyde to make um, inactivated viral vaccines. So formaldehyde bonds these proteins and DNA tightly together so that they don't come apart. Okay. And then you shear it. And shearing means you randomly break up the DNA. You can use enzymes that cut DNA, but most often you use some physical method. So sonication is where you have a sample and you put this probe in there and it sends out vibrations, high speed vibrations. And those high speed vibrations randomly break the DNA into lots of pieces. Because you've cross-linked, wherever enzymes are or proteins are in the blue circle, they will stay bound to that DNA. Then you do the IP part. So whenever you see the word immuno, that means you're using an antibody. Okay. Remember that antibodies are very specific for proteins. So in this case, we have an antibody to the polymerase. Okay. The P, the precipitation part, is also called pull down. So what's happening here is that you're specifically binding your antibody to the protein of interest and then you're pulling it down or you're pulling it away from all this other DNA here that was not bound. So you're getting specificity. Then you're going to use PCR to see what DNA was pulled down. So what DNA was interacting with that specific protein. So here's a little bit more complicated um, diagram, but shows a little bit more details. So again, you have your cells. In this case, they're gonna be virus infected cells that you cross-link so that the proteins in the DNA or RNA are tightly interacted. You lyse the cells, you burst them open, you fragment um, or um, break down or cut into little pieces the um, DNA okay. and then you start cleaning it up. So input is always going to be your control. What did you start with? Chips, what this is trying to show you is you can take one sample 
and split it up into multiple samples. And so you could use multiple antibodies. So you could look at the binding to polymerase and transcription factor 2, H, and an enhancer factor or something like that. Okay, And the way we pull down, do the precipitation, is your antibodies are usually on some kind of bead. And so here the bead is binding to the specific proteins. And this is showing you an example. And uh, I'm not exactly sure which chip method they use. But what's really cool is you can use a magnet with some of these new protocols. And so the beads will um, obviously be attracted to the magnet. And then you can wash away everything else that has not been bound. So you can get rid of all this nonspecific DNA. Okay. Eventually you have to undo the crosslink. Ooh, what was that spelling? Okay, so you're going to dissociate the DNA from the proteins from the antibodies. And then you can do PCR. Right? And we remember we talked a little bit about this before spring break. qPCR is quantitative PCR. You get these beautiful graphs, and um, what you're going to see as far as data um, is CT or CT cycle threshold. And these are these values, oops. are the numbers where you're getting this exponential um, amplification. Remember we talked about up here at the end of PCR, you can get a lot of things that look the same but really didn't start out with similar amounts. So um, doing quantitative allows us to be more accurate. And so the cycle threshold tells you how long it took to reach that exponential um, amplification phase. So just remember qPCR means you start with DNA, and if you see RT, Q, oh, I hate that, qPCR means you're starting with RNA. The other thing, if you're reading the um, methods, they talk about adding protease and phosphatase inhibitors okay. and that's because they don't want their proteins that are interacting if you look back here they don't want their proteins being chewed up and we can make mm, antibodies specific to say the S5 phosphate or say the S2 phosphate so you can have two different antibodies that are specific to those different phosphorylation states. So we also don't want to lose phosphatase. I don't know. We also don't want to lose those phosphates. And one of the um, key points of their paper is that they need to validate that the sonication or the fragmentation they're doing is valid and important in um, good for studying this um, viral DNA protein interactions. And again, I need to read through the paper again, but my guesstimate of why they're saying they need to really show that fragment size, um, that they're getting the accurate or, or important fragment size is, if the fragment size is too big, okay, and you pull down these pieces, right? You might be doing PCR here, and you're going to get a false positive. So you're going to think that that region is interacting with the protein when it really isn't. So you don't want too big a fragment size. And if you've got a fragment size that's too small, and say your primers are over here, you might get false negatives. You might not be able to detect it. So you want to get this optimal fragment size that is um, 
working with the primers you're designing for PCR. A couple other uh, molecular biology type information that they talk about is, are um, histones. So as the viral genome for herpes type viruses goes into latency because the viral genome is pretty big, it actually associates with histone proteins from the host. And these are proteins that are shown in yellow here that organize DNA. So your chromosomes are full of DNA wrapped around a histone. And as this DNA is wrapped around the histone, and the histone is this little dot in the center here, we know that this space is about 147 base pairs, right? And they talk about the space between genes for varicella zoster is about 272 base pairs. So they're trying to optimize the fragmentation of the DNA and the protein interactions. Um, when they talk about something called euchromatin, that means that the DNA is not so tightly wrapped around the histones, and in fact, RNA polymerase and transcription factors can find promoters to bind, and you get transcription happening. When DNA is in what we call heterochromatin, it's tightly wound up, and you can't bind the RNA polymerase. It can't find the promoters. And there are different modifications associated with histone proteins, such as um, acetylation for euchromatin and deacetylation for heterochromatin that can be important in deciding um, the state of the chromatin that your specific gene is, um, uh, I guess, the state that it's in. So here's just another um, image showing how open euchromatin is. Here's different types of um, modifications to those proteins. Don't worry about that right now. The other thing I want you to understand from this um, image is that there are regions called insulators, and there are certain proteins that bind to insulators, and they protect or block interactions between heterochromatin and euchromatin. So this is really what we cover in a molecular biology class, but they use a lot of this vocabulary, and so I don't want you to get lost in it. Just understand that um, it's a way to describe the state of the DNA. Um, in addition to RNA Pol 2 right here, there are lots of targets um, that you could use an antibody and look at protein DNA interactions. And so my feeling is that um, this study sets them up to say, okay, we have this good technique that works. We've confirmed some previously reported data with it. Now we're going to look at lots of different protein DNA, maybe protein RNA interactions based on um, this technique that we've validated in this paper. Okay, so what I'm getting from my first read through from this paper is it's partially a methods paper to show that their technique combined with their PCR and chip assays are working to detect proteins that are bound to viral DNA. Okay. Then they show some data that says RNA Pol 2 phosphorylation changes between the S5 and the S2 are different for virus transcripts than they are for eukaryotic transcripts. Like I said, I believe that was published back in 2012 by another group. So my gut feeling is, again, they're 
confirming, um, proving that their method works, and that this is setting them up for future studies. So, I hope this helps you a little bit with the paper. Um, don't hesitate to send questions as you're reading through it, and I can start making another front page to answer more questions as they come up. Um, I look forward to seeing you guys again. I hope you got some rest over spring break, and uh, see you Monday. All right, bye.